This is a last resort for a lot of these unidentified remains. These are lost souls. These family members are frozen in uncertainty. He was found in a wooded area in British Columbia. On his skull there was a, an exit wound for a bullet. Your skull is the foundation that your face is built on. All that information is in that structure. And there's that moment where you, it's not a skull anymore. It's like I stop when I see somebody staring back at me. I think this is one of the most important jobs that I'm ever going to do in my career. To bring 15 um, people home, essentially. I'm, I'm, I think I'm bringing people home. I'm really excited uh, for this journey and it's been, it feels like a long time coming. When I unwrap them, they're incredibly beautiful. And uh, they almost seem like works of art in and of themselves. Because your skull is the foundation that your face is built on. Everything is breaking down to your ears, your hairline, the projection of your nose, thickness of your lips, corners of your mouth, even the fold in your eyelids. All that information is in that structure. What if somebody sees this and is able to give this person their, their name back? Because they are, they're lost, they've lost their name. I cannot tell you enough how much I appreciate you guys willing to be here and donate your services to help ID these victims. These are lost, <laughs> lost souls, these are, uh, these family members are frozen in uncertainty, and hopefully, if, with you guys' help, we can answer these questions. So back in uh, August 2019, I joined uh, Joe Mullen's course to learn how to do post-mortem reconstruction and age progression digitally. It was during that class that he mentioned this wonderful uh, reconstruction class that he actually taught once a year at the New York Academy of Art. He had been doing it since 2015 and it had been so successful that they had actually cleared the shelves at the New York Medical Examiner's office of all unidentified remains. And so for his upcoming class, class, he didn't have any skulls. So I said, Joe, I think I can get you some Canadian skulls. That was basically the conversation. I didn't have any expectations. I didn't, it, skulls is not, not what Charity does. That's not her specialty, but she just went home and talked to the right people and just made it happen. This is a last resort for a lot of these unidentified remains. The other investigative avenues have long been gone. There are no clues anymore. Perhaps there's no DNA or nothing to compare to. You need you know, to be able to compare DNA to. Uh, and fingerprints are no longer there. So this is, our, this is their last hope. The 15 cases that the artists are going to be working on today are uh, from British Columbia and Nova Scotia. So we have 14 from uh, British Columbia and one from Nova Scotia. They range in age from approximately 20 years old up to approximately 70 years old. They go back as far as 1972 up until September 2019. So we have a wide range of unidentified remains that were found in that time. They have been found in different places uh, throughout those regions. They were in different states when they were found. Uh, but in the end, uh, their, their skull, their cranium, were in good enough condition that we were able to, to scan them. And they were able to make a very um, dis distinct, detailed uh, replication of the actual skull. And that's what the students will be working on. There's not a lot of information on my guy. All I do know is that he's a male anywhere from 25 to 40 years old. He was found in a wooded area in British Columbia. But other than that, there's not a lot of information, um, except for the fact that he was found in 2016, but they believe that he had died years prior. 
He's an indigenous gentleman, um, five foot seven to five foot nine. He um, was between 45 and 55, um, but they think he possibly could have been older than that. Also, he was found on the south arm of the Fraser River um, amongst some debris and some logs at high tide. He's between 30 and 49 years old, of Mongolian Asian descent, six foot, 130 pounds, um, long black hair. I hope I can uh, reunite him with someone. I just feel like a sense of responsibility of trying to construct a face in, in a likeness and, um, and, and hope that someone will be able to recognize because he's been missing for more than 20 years. One of the cases that we have from Nova Scotia uh, are the remains of a, an adult male that was washed on shore after Hurricane Dorian. So uh, today we have uh, Joe Mullins who is actually uh, working on his reconstruction and um, hopefully by the end of the week we will actually have an identity for him, a face for him uh, to release to the public. So I have one of the, the newest cases that we're working on this week. New as in it was discovered in September of 2019. So the newer the case is, the more likelihood that somebody is able to, to recognize it. So the information that each student is given, they have a basic assessment to give you the parameters to how to put the face on it. We have age range, male or female, general characteristics, any, any like say trauma or healed fractures or a broken nose or crooked teeth, those are great things to show because that's something that would, people would see, that's something people recognize in life. We're able to piece piece each, each feature back on the face, because your skull is the foundation that your face is built on. Well, on his skull there was um, an exit wound for a bullet, as well as I believe there is some sort of blunt force trauma to the side, but the bullet exited from the back. And then in his case file it also said that he may have been despondent within like a year before his death. You have a handout, so it's probably for the next hour and 15 minutes, I want you to get started on sculpting the muscles. It's an anatomical approach. It's called the Manchester Method. So when you're done, you should be able to count 11 muscles on your skull, but you can't do them, you can't do them too thick. The technique that we're using, it's pretty amazing. There's scientific depth markers of how thick the tissue is on the face. So the muscles are a certain thickness and then you're putting on these tissue markers using straws and then you're building tissue out to those markers. And they're set markers, for, obviously for an average face, but they're a good indication of where to start. Really yeah. long. He has a really short chin. Yeah. Like a super short chin. It's like crazy. So it's like so cool. And then this is okay. You yeah. Just carry on with so it. remember, the only thing I stress is to make sure that you everything is tying into that. So you sh still should be able to see, see the outline. The nothing, <laughs> nothing on top of this. Yeah. It's really interesting how the, all the bony landmarks really dictate uh, how the muscles are gonna behave on top of it. The cheekbones are sort of high, and. Um, the mouth it's not that big, so I'm interested to see once we put the nose on, how it's really gonna come together. It's just amazing how just to unlock those secrets that that skull is telling you. It's a wonderful collaboration where art and science have to come together to put the right face on these skulls. My background has always kind of been in art. Due to personal circumstances, I decided I wanted to career change um, much later on in life so I came to the school and I started last September. I think art should be a really healing thing. It's 
it's very interesting when you're working and touching, even though it's a 3D printed version of, of the actual skull, you're touching somebody who no longer exists in this world's face. In a strange way, you're feeling them, you're holding them in your hands and you're trying to create life from the skull. Should I take a photo here? Was there a press release that had information about, about this case, what stuff that was relevant? No, just the size, just the pants. There's a picture of the pants. Size 36 waist? 36, yes. He was a short, probably like five nine, maybe a little bit taller, but he had huge leg muscles. So that's that's an indicator that gives us an idea if this does not it's not going to be a skinny, a scrawny individual. It's probably about probably in his forties, so just a more rounded, healthy looking individual. I know that the artists are going to do an amazing job. They have a world-renowned forensic artist teaching them, and I know that the final outcome is going to be an amazing identity for them. It's going to be their face that's going to appear for us. I drive myself crazy with the details. I can go back and forth. I'll cut the nose off, re-sculpt it. I'll pull the eye out or set, reset it. There's lots of back and forth, but I'm thinking of, I, I, I have to get it right. For me, it's like I have to have the skull, like looking straight, I have to work the eye to eye with the, with the skull that I'm working on. That's back to that, the pressure, the, the intensity, the, the focus, I was like, I, I can't, I can't screw this up. If I get something wrong, they're not gonna get identified. That family is gonna be continued to be frozen in uncertainty. Those answers are never gonna come. So noses, like uh, ears, you know, the soft, soft tissue, the cartilage, it's very limited information that we get. We get, we get the direction, if it, you take your clay soaked finger and stick it in your filtrum and push up, you're gonna hit your nasal spine. Now your nasal spine acts like an arrow to tell you where your, where your nose is pointing, up, down, straight out. We're gonna set some toothpicks in there to get that projection is that how far it's going to stick out? Yeah, so your tip is going to be like right. One of my many, many favorite aspects of this class is seeing how the students react to, to these cases. I enjoy seeing the transition from Monday to you know, Tuesday, where it's just kind of the busy work. You don't really start to see uh, the individual features. When we start adding those features, you're going to notice a difference. You know, people are buzzing, chattering around. Wednesday, Thursday, it's quiet because the room is filled now with 16 extra people. The skull had a lot of fractures that were on the skull before he died. And so it's obvious that he had a, a pretty tough life. Um, he had no teeth prior to death. Um, fractures um, on the side, up on the cheek. His nose was broken. There's a lot going on. So when I look at him, I just, I wonder what he went through, you know, what, what he was going through at the time of his death. Now that more features are coming into the face, it's starting to do this funny play of, it turning from a job to now it's, now it's somebody starting to ask me a question. Um, you can, he has a, almost an expression on his face as though he's asking if, if I can help him. There's no way it can't change you. It, it's so, um, it's such a powerful, thing to, to be a part of and to see come back, 
to life something that was lost. One of the cases from the New York City Medical Examiner's Office, which was featured in a New York Times article, a cousin in California saw the sculpture that was featured in the article, and it sparked that recognition. My name is Carmen, and I'm the aunt of Danny. A cousin of his recognized Danny's face in your work. Thank you for the work you did that allowed my family to put an ending to our story of pain. In identifying and reclaiming him, our family has come back together in a way we have not been able to do since his disappearance. Thank you for giving us this important relief. I remember every, the right person has to see it, and just coincidence that, that that image made it all the way from here to California, and so anyway, he was recognized. We're getting close to 100 skulls, 100 uh, uh, reconstructions that we've made for, to, for identification. Of those 100 um, skulls, I know that we have had four identifications. We had a, a couple of classes that reconstructed uh, skulls of migrants uh, in Arizona uh, that had died crossing the Sonoran Desert. They actually took side-by-side -side photographs, an actual photograph from when they were alive compared to our reconstruction, and uh, the, the resemblance uh, was striking. What did they tell you about the corners of the mouth? Anybody? What do they line up with? It goes to the pupil. It goes down to the, it's on the medial side of the iris. I was taught you go down to the center and you know, that's going to tell you where the corner of the mouth is. It sits down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it comes straight down. It's at the, okay. it's at the bottom of that thing Jewel. pointing, pointing oh, straight down. Okay. So how do you know when you're done? Me, personally, I know when I'm done. I've, it's just a moment, and I'll be working on the back, you know, sculpting hair, and I'll flip it around, and there's that moment where you, it's not a skull anymore. It's like I stop when I see somebody staring back at me. It looks like a sad, concerned face, or whatever it is. You start thinking about what was he doing before he passed away? What was he, what was he thinking about? Was it a homicide? Did he suicide? Those, those are all the thoughts, but just the expression has that, he's like he's pondering something. That's just my personal opinion. That's not what I was shooting for, but that's just what happened. <laughs> it's amazing. It's unbelievable to literally start from nothing and see it develop into something that has so much psychological weight to it. And as it gets more detailed, you kind of get more, you can't help but get more personally involved into it. It's like the weight of it is really real. <laughs> it became someone looking at you. Like I say, the eyes are the window to the soul. So like, there it is. <laughs> Today, there's definitely somebody staring back at you and you're just asking those questions, am I doing you right? I'm looking at this person kind of going, tell me, tell me, do you look like this? Should I move this? And there's almost like a dialogue that goes back and forth between you and this person in front of you. It's a very strange feeling actually. This journey on this, on this course has definitely made me think about becoming a forensic artist. Um, the fact that I could actually use my art to help people um, has always been part of what I feel my art journey is. This has changed me in a different way. There's millions of skulls out there and there's millions of fine artists out there that are, just haven't flexed that forensic muscle yet. So. Hopefully with this type of exposure and attention brought in this class, we can inspire and just keep doing this until there's no more skulls. How amazing would that be? So we're gonna take a group photo. Yeah, if you're done, scoot it over there. Look at what you guys did in the course of a week. Granted, it got a little hectic at times, but if you are inspired to do this, remember there are thousands, no, not to oversell, thousands and thousands and thousands of skulls 
across the U.S. And that's just in the U.S. I saw Anita crying and now I'm going to cry. So thanks, thanks Anita. <laughs> well, this has been an amazing project to work on. Just being part of it. And I can tell you that being in this room and watching these faces come alive has just been incredible. You're a forensic artist now. You've done a facial reconstruction of an unidentified human being that hopefully you can, the talent and skills that you've you brought to this classroom can make a difference. It's gonna make a difference. It already has, because you've given these, all these people a chance to get their ID back, get give them their names back. And imagine what the thanks, we can thank you, but Imagine what the family's gonna feel like when they have those answers because of something you did in this class.